Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm probably going to have to do a presentation at Becca about what I'm doing this past week. And I'm about to do a group of pictures. Sure. So I'm going to include that. So whenever we can do that, maybe at the end. That's great. Christine will can facilitate that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So we're going to uh, get going. Um, we're going to cover one more topic um, at a theoretical level, getting into particle filtering. And then I think what we'll probably do is um, uh, do a little bit of hands-on work. Um, this will involve both a um, little bit of work with a particle filter. Um, uh, model uh, to to take a look at it, um, uh, and it will also involve uh, a little bit of additional work using Ethica. Okay, um, so uh, this next session I wanted to use to provide some motivations for this technique, which I consider to be a kind of a keystone technique. Uh, within these combinations of system science and data science. Uh, I also plan to introduce it because it is um, one of the foremost ways uh, that I know to uh, combine uh, dynamic models uh, that are in widespread use with, with incoming data sources. I wanted to provide uh, sort of a motivation and then provide an entry level introduction to this technique. I'm gonna go try to go pretty quickly over the particle filtering motivation, um, but enough to, to give you a sense of why we're, um, uh, why we're uh, excited about this technique. So often, uh, so I'm gonna approach this from a couple of angles. Um, Often we have multiple lines of evidence, of empirical evidence, that relate to different elements of some underlying system. A system that is characterized not with the discrete and typically categorical states we saw with, with uh, hidden Markov models, but with continuous states, such as we're concerned about the number of people, for example, who may be um, uh, in chronic pain and not disordered, in chronic pain and disordered, uh, those who are who have uh, an opioid-related uh, disorder, those those uh, who have opioid-related disorders focused on uh, who, are, who are dependent on prescription only versus those making use of illegally sourced uh, narcotics, etc. Um, and we may have evidence for this system at only a few paces, and the underlying system here is continuous. It's, um, uh, it can, uh, it's not just it's in one of a couple of states that are discrete. It's rather it could have uh, a large number of people who are in a disordered state or a smaller number, a medium number, and, and similarly with respect to the other states. We're interested here in knitting together data sources with different um, levels of reliability, and we're interested in having a consistent picture of what's going on in the underlying system, the underlying simulation uh, model is characterized, character, uh, the system is characterized by a simulation model. And as with hidden Markov models, that underlying system is typically mostly latent. More than that, it's evolving over time. It's evolving according to processes characterized in the simulation model, much as the hidden Markov model system is evolving according to certain probabilities. Um, and one of the foremost motivations here is we want to be able to use the model of the underlying system to evaluate trade-offs between interventions. But we want to do it in a way that is true to the current context, to the current situation. So you know, an example here is you might have something like H1 influenza. And we have data on um, 
uh, incident case counts, for example, of lab diagnosed H1N1 cases and maybe emergency department influenza-like illness admissions. Uh, perhaps we have incident case counts of, of those by age group. But maybe we also have some of the types of data we saw yesterday afternoon, you know, uh, influenza-related searches, people searching out of interest for vaccination or for symptomology. Um, maybe we have Twitter mentions of influenza cases, uh, something we'll hear more about on, on Friday. Um, and perhaps we have data uh, related to um, vaccinations delivered. Th those relate to parts of a system, and we want to hypothesize what's going on in terms of the likely number of individuals who are sick, recognizing that only a fraction of them actually get reported. We want to know something about the number of individuals who are likely to become sick soon. They're, they're exposed now and they're likely to become sick, even though we don't have direct data on it. We're, we're interested in estimating the number of susceptible people out there, uh, despite the fact that we have uh, no direct data from seroprevalence studies related to susceptibility. A second example here would be, imagine we're interested in gestational and type 2 diabetes, and maybe we have incident case counts for cases of gestational diabetes and type 2 diabetes. We have some number of macrosomic births, births of, of babies that are, that are uh, six to four kilograms or larger, which gives some indication as to the levels of glycemic control during pregnancy. And then perhaps we have a total number of births and some sort of cross-sectional weight profiles for population subsets. This data relates to pieces of particular points in an underlying system which is more complex, involving gestational and type 2 diabetes. Or with suicide, maybe we have incident case counts for completed suicides and suicide attempts, suicide-related searches and serious Google mentions of, of suicide and suicide helpline calls. And we're interested in understanding the balance of people at risk within the population, individuals with concrete suicidal ideation who are engaged in perhaps planning, uh, those with non-concrete suicidal ideation, using data such as this. Okay, so in this context, in all these contexts, we have data on certain parts of a system and no data on large number of parts of the system. And we'd like to try to leverage that data to, to tell us what's likely going on in that underlying system. Much as for HMMs, we tried to use data that we did have to, to infer what underlying discrete state, categorical state we were in. Okay, now, in other contexts, such as imaging modalities, uh, like um, CT scans, MRI imaging, we have ways of, of taking multiple lines of evidence, uh, say images from different angles, each of them very incomplete in, in creating a picture of the whole. So, for example, we create a 3D picture of the internal structure out of images, each of which has occlusions and suffers for limited coverage of the body. And we'd like to hear, see if we could construct a similar picture of what's going on in the underlying system using multiple lines of data and knowledge of, of how the system works, okay? We have a dynamic model. It depicts a posited set of, um, of, of, of dynamics in the underlying system, much as an HMM specified dynamics within this Markov model, the probability of transition between states, so our dynamic model depicts. And it can be used, if it's grounded, to project forward and to evaluate interventions. And we're hoping to align this model, much as we did with an HMM, to understand what's, what's likely the case right now, or what was the case earlier. Um, one of the challenges with this is traditionally when we build a model and you know, we undergo a process called calibration, which aligns it with evidence. We, we adjust parameter values so that its output aligns with evidence. But it's a very manual process. It involves reparameterization, it involves a lot of, of involved study and learning. Young Chen can speak about this in some detail. Um, 
there's also real limitations when it gives you. It gives you point estimates for parameter values, um, typically, rather than, than a sense of the distribution of possibilities. Um, it's uh, specific to a particular model. And very importantly, while it may give you the best estimates for values of parameters, it doesn't do much to keep that model updated as new data comes in. And as I argued before, even the best of models becomes increasingly outdated as time passes. We'll come back to that point. So that's one perspective. We have all this evidence, and we know something about the dynamics of the underlying situation, much as we did with hidden Markov models. And we're wondering, can we knit together this evidence, as we did with hidden Markov models, together with the knowledge of the system, to, to tell us what's likely going on now and what's likely occurred in the past, and use that to ground our understanding of in terms of projecting forward or in terms of asking what if questions about interventions. A second problem that I want to use to motivate this is the need to respond to unfolding situations. So um, an example exemplar here, not unique, is outbreak responses. Other exemplars could be drawn for other types of public health crises, whether it's natural disasters or, or uh, clusters of suicides or what have you. Um, and the idea here is that uh, often we may have data coming in about where we're at, say, for an outbreak. But by itself, that gives little clarity as to what lies forward. We may have a time series that looks ominous in terms of growing rates, but it doesn't tell us where it's going. And we'd like to be able to, um, to anticipate where things are going. The challenge is that... Um, when we have a model to be used in this context, often there's little opportunity to really build a model that's really well tied in with data. Um, for an emerging outbreak, say something like SARS or MERS um, or H1N1 and N1 influenza, so-called swine flu, um, there was big uncertainties epidemiologically about what was going on. And there was little chance to build a really sophisticated model for anticipating it. And and uh, by the time a, a highly grounded model can be created, often the real urgency of the moment has passed. And we're dealing with the prospect of working with very rough models to inform the situation that are not really tied down well by emerging evidence. Um, so we can plan based on a grossly inaccurate model, a model that's, that's our best guess, or we can await a highly detailed model that will take too long to build. But even with the best model, the problem is that even the most detailed model, the most well-informed model, the model that incorporates all the evidence when we built it, will eventually diverge. I've argued this before, and I don't think I'll have to elaborate much. Perhaps most importantly, it omits stochastics of various, of various sorts, um, uh, you know, which, are, which are all in the world around us. But it also inevitably is going to oversimplify, uh, misestimate values. And uh, as a result, over time, it's going to depart. Its expectations are going to depart from the current situation. And if its baseline was 2015 and we run it forward, its estimate for 2018 may be a great variance from what we currently see, what we currently acknowledge to be the case. What that can lead to is a sense that models, once built, depreciate rapidly in value. I'm going to be providing for these two problems, these problems of wanting to knit together multiple lines of evidence and knowledge of model structure into a consistent picture of what's going on now so that we can use that to inform our planning. And secondly, this need to stay current with emerging evidence particularly in areas where we don't have a great deal of evidence um, and where we can't afford a model that goes increasingly divergent from the situation, I'm going to argue that particle filtering will provide an effective means of accomplishing that. I want to use an analogy to, to help motivate this further. And the analogy is a familiar one. For those who uh, can imagine being at your workplace, you 
are assured, whether you're a student or a professional, you very well understand, you have a very good mental model of how to get from your workplace to your home. Very well established, quite refined, you know, all the intersections involved, you know, all the stop, the street lights, stop signs, uh, all those sort of things. And you could walk home even uh, in a heavy snowstorm or I don't know what the equivalent is in Australia, a sandstorm um, <laughs> or something. Um, or even, when, even in after dusk, right? Um, we have very good mental models. Um, but I would argue that it would be foolhardy in the extreme to use one of these very, very good models to try to walk home in an open loop fashion. That is, with our, in a fashion which doesn't update our, our mental model with actual observation. And the reasoning is clear, right? Um, even with the very best of model, we're not going to be able to anticipate stochastics like whether a light is green or not, whether the walk sign is, is on or not, uh, exactly where the sidewalk ends or where the, the ramp down from the sidewalk onto the pavement to cross a road begins. Our mental models are good, but in order to accurately maneuver in the real world, we need something beyond a good model. We need incoming evidence. We need incoming information that will ground us as to where we currently are. We need some reference point to tell us where we are now to give us confidence about where we need to go. Right? Um, and without that, we'd have growing inaccuracy about where we're at. Our expectations of where we're at would grow increasingly divergent from reality, much as a model grows increasingly divergent, left to its own devices, from the current situation. Uh, we wouldn't be able to anticipate stochastics, uh, and that would contribute to it. Um, there'd be gaps in the completeness of our mental model, much as there are in our computational models. And in both cases, they, grow, um, they risk growing obsolete. We don't account for a construction in our mental model that is there today and trips us up on the sidewalk. So for both our mental models and, I would argue, computational models, observations are needed to get us home safely and to let us know where to go next, how we have to head, head next. And neither the model nor the observations are enough on our own. Taken in isolation, the model will end us up on our face if we don't have observations coming in. If we tried to walk home with our eyes closed, we'd end up in the bottom of staircases or, or flat out on the street. If we were just depending on observations and we didn't have a mental model about where to go, we wouldn't be getting home. It's hard to, to get where you're going to if you don't know where it is, right? Um, so we need both together. And yet, traditionally with simulation models, our models have been blind in the sense that their eyes have been closed, their computational eyes. They haven't been considering incoming data. So the vision here and the motivator, the motivating um, impulse for, for what I'm going to be describing to you in, in technical terms is this desire to have, to lend our models eyes, to lend them the ability to observe and reground their understanding of where they're at now and thereby have greater confidence about what trade offs, about the trade offs between interventions. Um, uh, in, in assessing the trade-offs between interventions and projecting forward. So the idea here is to try to provide a way that even rough and ready models can be built quickly, um, uh, built quickly, but automatically kept current with evidence, automatically regrounded when evidence and sharpened by evidence when evidence comes in. So we can build the model quickly and then have it honed much as we hone it with a knife sharpener, we can have it honed by data, and we can have it kept current by data, much as, as we're walking home. Um, maybe we're looking at our smartphone most of the way, but if we look up occasionally, we'll know where we are and can route ourselves in a way that, that's very confident. We don't rely just on model predictions about where we're currently at, but also empirical observations. As so much as your GPS system, can route you where it wants to go, but in order to do that, it needs the occasional GPS signal to tell you, hey, you're here. And it actually takes that GPS signal and recognizes it's fallible. There's some degree of uncertainty about it, 
And so it is with these models. We're going to have fallible measurements, each of them ambiguous, each of them limited, fallible model predictions, and we're going to combine the two to give confidence about where we're at. And we're going to keep the model state current with the latest evidence so that we can evaluate the effects of interventions. Consider a model of infectious disease, for example. Um, if we consider the trade-offs between interventions, say the, the gain that we might get with an outbreak response immunization campaign versus what we might gain by closing schools, for example, for, for some period of time. How much we gain with that immunization campaign will depend on some critical things about the current situation. For example, the number of people who are susceptible out there who are not already exposed or not already recovered. And I would argue that without the ability to know where we're at right now, how many susceptible people there are out there, our ability to evaluate the effects of interventions to say how much will be gained with school closer compared to outbreak response immunization campaign will be really limited. If we have a really good reading on how many people are susceptible, it will give us a much better sense of the trade-off between those, uh, those, those types of interventions, how much we gain through each, than if we didn't know our current situation well. So this ability to keep a model current in its expectation of what's going on right now is central to our ability to evaluate the impacts, the relative strength of the impacts of, of, of different interventions. The ability to know where we are right now is critical to know how to get to where we want to get go to, whether it's lowering the burden of opioid use disorders or lowering uh, overdoses, or whether it's, it's attempts to lower the number of uh, children that, that uh, develop severe complications from pertussis. And without this, if we just have a model that's built in 2015 and we're projecting forward with even the best of calibrations, even ongoing calibrations, it will be very different in its expectations of what's going on right now in 2018 than we know is the case, okay? So we're gonna be keeping this model current much as when you walk home, looking up occasionally, we'll let you know where you are and that will clue you into where you need to go next, how quickly you need to turn left on that street or, or, or cross the street. Or much as your GPS will give you a huge benefit by telling you where you are now to be able to inform where to turn to get to where you want to go, okay? So our goal here is quickly formulated to allow for quick formulation of models that are then regrounded and sharpened via evidence. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what is delivered by Park Book. Okay, it's this ability to have these this evidence. But it's different from, from what we have with HMMs in several ways. You may, this may remind you of HMMs. But with HMMs, we were indeed using evidence coming in on an ongoing basis and knowledge model structure to estimate model state. But the evolving system was discrete in nature. It, it, it couldn't deal with the fact we're of, of estimating, okay, are there more people susceptible or fewer on a continuous basis? It was more, are we in you know, an outbreak state or not? <laughs> or are we are we driving or not? Are we you know, sitting, standing, lying down, off person, or engaged in active behavior? We didn't have that ability to estimate continuous state. And what we had in terms of the model behavior um, was uh, more constrained. It couldn't allow for non-linearity. We posited a certain probability per ton unit of, of leaving a state that was independent of the the, the broad state of, of the, uh, the broader um, situation in the model in a way that, that is not the case for dynamic models, so di uh, for, for system science models, for nonlinear models. With nonlinear models, we have a probability, say, of getting infected that depends on the number of people who are infected already, for example. Okay, so we're going to talk about particle filtering. Um, Particle filtering provides this approach to automatically regrounded and sharpened model. Um, it's one of a number of filtering methods out there. Filtering is a term that has evolved in its meaning. Um, 
Here we're using filtering to describe a situation where we're estimating the underlying state of the system given incoming data. And a traditional filtering system known as Coleman filtering has been around for years. Okay? Coleman filtering was created in the 1950s or perhaps it was early 60s by Rudolf, Rudolf Coleman. It's an amazing technique based on um, uh, Bayesian mathematics um, and evolution of, of underlying state space of a system. Uh, and it's widely used. It's used in aeronautics, for example, in uh, guiding planes and guiding missiles. Um, and, uh, and here we have data that can come in at very high rates, like many tons a second. And we're estimating on the basis of where the plane thinks it should be based on the thrust of its engines and its weight and the, its airspeed and so on, where it thinks it is. And then we're getting data, say, from GPS systems that tell it where it is roughly. And each of those is very fallible. The, the plane's understanding of where it should be might not take into account aspects of, of the precipitation that's, um, that it's flying through. And, and the GPS readings are error prone because of inaccuracies in that. So both of them are, in, are fallible, but common filtering provides a way of combining them to give a point estimate about where the plane is now and with some range of variation around it. Unfortunately, Coleman filtering is limited in very important ways by some very stiff restrictions. One is um, it's for linear systems, that it's most effective. When we have a nonlinear system, we have to linearize it, and it can lead to real issues when it comes to nonlinear systems, where its estimates are just systematically way off from what is actually going on. Second of all, it assumes distributions in terms of the errors, which in a health context, an epidemiological context, are, are really problematic. And amongst other things, it assumes Gaussian, that is normal distributions for errors. And if you're dealing with a small number of cases of illness, for example, and you're assuming a Gaussian distribution of errors, you'll be saying, well, negative cases of illness are possible, which is completely implausible. And the truth is, common filtering is a great tool if your data is arriving many times a second, maybe once every 100 milliseconds. If your data is arriving once an hour, once every 15 minutes, or once, uh, once a day, it's, it's ludicrously limited in what it can do compared to more modern techniques. And we're going to be talking today about a more modern technique, particle filtering, that takes the promise of Kalman filtering to an entirely different level and delivers in a much more general solution. So here, in contrast to Kalman filtering, we're not going to try to estimate one privilege value for where the system is right now. One particular assumption about how many people are susceptible, how many people are exposed right now, how many people are infected, and how many people are recovered. We're not going to put our eggs in one basket and assume that's what the situation is. That's the single most likely situation. Rather, we're going to posit a set of different hypotheses, which, which each of which will weigh and will, will consider as more or in some cases as less likely, and consider all of them for their merits, and operate over time not with one privileged hypothesis, but with an evolving distribution of hypotheses, a distribution of possibilities for what's going on out there in the world, where the ones that are consistent with the evidence will be fruitful and will multiply and will be fostered, and the ones that are less consistent with the evidence will die out and will disappear as possibilities. In contrast to common filtering, particle filtering has very general distribution assumptions. Um, you could specify a likelihood function of, 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 of your choice form. Um, it doesn't force any sort of Gaussian uh, assumptions. It doesn't impose linearity um, constraints. Uh, and it doesn't require a system that's, at a mathematical level, differentiable. Um, and computations for particle filtering can readily be accomplished within minutes for most, uh, most systems. Um, 
uh, in a way that's com perfectly consistent with the frequency of evidence we have for most, most systems. And with, with tools uh, that will parallelize this, such as GPUs, um, you can likely do this in, a, in, in considerably less time uh, yet. So in, in very highest level terms, particle filtering allows us to sample from a set of different hypotheses, a, a consensus distribution that, that considers both incoming data as itself fallible and underlying state of a model as also fallible. Okay, it's combining these two for a picture on, on what's going on. Um, the particle filter uh, will consider both of these and arrive at a, some sort of consensus estimate that balances, uh, balances these. Um, and as each new data point comes in, it will go from a prior estimate to a, a posterior estimate that considers that new, that new value. Um, and it's doing this by a sort of ensemble method in the sense that it's running a model with many high competing hypotheses, each of which is called associated with a particle. Okay? And the particles are weighted according to the pedigree, the, sort of the, the uh, plausibility of that hypothesis as evidenced by existing data. Um, so uh, within this context, uh, we can use a model which has undergone particle filtering for several different purposes. One is to understand what's likely going on in the current situation, both in areas that are observed and in areas of, of the, the system that may not be observed, but are whispered to us by considering what data we do know in the structure of the model that tells us something about what's going on. That may sound odd. How is it that if we don't have evidence about something like the number of susceptible people in the population that we could know anything about it by, by data, say, about the number of people recovering from illness in, their ho in the hospital or the number of people who are newly diagnosed with illness. How could that tell us anything about the number of susceptibles? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a similar way in which with HMMs, we could learn something about whether we're in a certain state by information about where we were the previous time set. It, it may be that we have evidence about what's going on in certain areas of the system. And when we combine that with knowledge of the model, it's inevitable that that will tell us something about what's going on in other areas of the system. An example is, suppose we have lots of people within the past week who have gotten infected. Lots and lots of people are getting infected from the data we do know. And we have a model that shows, now wait a minute, for someone to get infected, there needs to be an infective to infect them and a susceptible to get infected. So the fact that we have lots of people who have gotten infected in the last week is an indication that likely we have quite a few susceptibles around. We don't have a measurement to the number of susceptibles, but the logic of the system is such that if someone's getting infected, there's got to be a pool of susceptibles that are coming from. And if we have lots of infections, there's got to be lots of people uh, who are susceptible to get infected. So the data that we do have, combined with the model structure, the knowledge of how infection works, that it's drawing from susceptibles to infectives, and it requires susceptibles for it to yield new infect cases of new, in new cases of infection, tells us something about what's going on upstream where we don't have direct measurements. The logic of the model combined with the evidence points to the underlying situation, much as it did for an HMM where we considered, sure, the lines, lines of incoming data, but we also considered the structure of the model, the probability of going from one state to the other and informing what was likely going on right now. Here we can do it across a model, even in areas not directly illuminated by data or indirectly illumined by the data we have in the structure of the model. They're adumbrated by the model in terms of, um, of, of uh, casting some understanding on 
So that's one thing we can do with the model with particle filtering. Having, having gotten this data and the structure of the model, we can know what's probably going on right now. How many susceptibles are there out there? Could that be useful? Darn right it could be useful to know about whether you should plan an outbreak immunization campaign in a certain age group. If you know lots of 10 to 14 year olds are likely, likely susceptible, we, will, we may want to target them. And that gets to this last point that, that to evaluate interventions, we'll be able to evaluate them with much greater clarity if we know the current situation. So particle filtering will support probabilistic assessment of the joint distribution of having a certain situation in the model, the joint distribution of being in different states, uh, having different values for different states. Knowing, okay, one plausible situation is we have a lot of susceptibles and fewer infectives, and other possibilities we have a lot of infectives and fewer susceptibles, but no hy plausible hypothesis posits very few in, uh, susceptibles, for example. So we have a probabilistic distribution over the current, in our assessment of the current situation. That can allow us to probabilistically project forward where the, uh, the system is likely to go, all of the things being equal and allow us to probabilistically evaluate different interventions, recognizing that, that um, uh, there's a set of possible outcomes for interventions based on the uncertainty uh, associated with our assessment of the underlying state. Okay, um, so um, Anahita will be talking about H1N1 in, um, in Manitoba uh, later, later today. Um, uh, she's going to be presenting a model that's more sophisticated than this one. This is a very basic one. We have susceptibles, exposed, infected, recovered, and vaccinated individuals. Um, and our data might point, for example, to the number of individuals going from exposed to infective. But the logic of the model is such that you combine that with an understanding of the model and it illumines these different, the likely values of these different states. And at a given point, we might have data up to the certain point that's uh, informed our understanding of what's going on. And with the model, we project forward in some sort of uh, probabilistic way going forward. This is a distribution of what the model thinks there might be in terms of number of cases from now forward as informed by data only up to time 21 there. Um, here, uh, by data up to time 28, projecting forward, taking into account all this data about what it suggests about the number of people in different states and perhaps some changing parameter values. It allows us to project forward what we anticipate lying forward from here. But it's doing this not in a curve-fitting sort of way that it's just drawing a line and anticipating it. It's doing it because it estimates the underlying state of the model on the, on the basis of this evidence and uses that to say, well, if this hypothesis is plausible, what would it imply going forward? Or this other hypothesis is also a good competing hypothesis, what would it imply? Some hypotheses are more likely, some are less likely according to their weight and collectively they lead to a distribution of possibilities going forward. And as more evidence comes in, we project forward with increasing clarity as to what's likely going on. Or this from work of Sha Yen, who will also be bringing you some descriptions. This, is, this was earlier work, uh, I think. She's gonna be providing you a bit of updates on it, and it's gone great places since then. Um, but here we have data uh, from observations on the number of incident cases. And we are, every time a new case is being brought in, we are regrounding the model in it. Much as when new, when new evidence came in here, we update the model and we use it to hone the model's understanding of what's going on, recognizing there's many competing hypotheses for what's going on in the underlying system. So it is with, uh, with this. And I want to emphasize this, showing these these uh, outputs of stocks down here, that the model at a given point is estimating not just the number of cases um, going on right now, it's estimating the full underlying state of the model. How many people are susceptible probabilistically? There's a distribution over that and over infectives 
and over the number of contacts per day and the number of recovered people and the number of exposed people. You could see it's more uncertain at certain times. You could see that it's more certain at other times. Um, some of these underlying estimates, like the number of exposed people, there can be broad ranges of uncertainty. And then some data comes in that makes it much more clear and it collapses it down. So you have all these different hypotheses being entertained. And as each new data point come up, there's a survival of the fittest in terms of the hypotheses. The ones that are more consistent with the data are multiplied on, and the ones less consistent disappear. Um, here, as new data comes in, the model updates its understanding and uses that to update its, its sense of what's happening. As outbreaks occur, it knows, OK, there's a sudden decrease in the number of susceptibles, inevitable. And then as no outbreak occurs for a long time, as there's a, a long period without an outbreak, the number of people who are susceptible will inevitably rise in the hypothesis because of the inexorable logic of the model. If there's no one getting infected, there ain't nothing that can be happening other than a buildup in the number of kids who are susceptible. Okay? So the logic of the underlying situation is captured by the model is being combined here with data and long periods of stasis inevitably shape a, a hypothesis mix which posits across all the different hypotheses uh, a growing number of cases of susceptible. So this corresponds actually to this, this period here. Now, from any one place, for example, we may have mo uh, model data up to this point. And now, from this point, having incorporated data from the point to this point, where, where we have a certain estimate for each of these values of stocks right now. This is actually a joint distribution that's shown each of these independently. But really, each hypothesis, each particle has a sum it, it, puts it, it, it puts its stand on having a certain number of people susceptible, a certain number exposed, a certain number infected, a certain number recovered. Each particle is taking a stand on the particulars of the underlying state. And if the particles are competing, this particle says, I think there's more susceptibles and fewer infectives and a moderate number of recovered. And another one obstreperously says, nah, you're up to lunch. I think there's. There's a lot more susceptibles than you ever imagined. It's just that there's a low contact rate. And there's, there's uh, more, more recovered individuals from the past. They each have a different take on the current situation. And having incorporated that data to this point, there's a fit set of particles that have survived thus far, that are, have been consistent with the evidence thus far. And then, we can ask going forward, what's likely to come about? You notice that? So we, we, we've incorporated data to this point. We have a certain hypothesis about what's going on. This is about 2025, 20, which is somewhere around, around there. And now we want to ask, what's likely to happen going forward? We have no data. We're just projecting forward now. The data points may be shown here, but we're, we're, the model's not taking them into account. It's just projecting forward, and we're comparing about what actually happens. So you notice the model thinks, OK, there's going to be a dropping number of cases. There'll probably be a secondary outbreak here. Uh, and then it gets increasingly uncertain. There's a broad distribution after that. And it's increasingly uncertain what will be happening, the number of susceptibles and so on after that, because of stochastics and, and uncertainty about um, uh, the particular about when outbreaks occur. But you notice it thinks, it pauses, there's quite a chance of an outbreak in the, in the near future there, which is in fact reflected in a, in a large, uh, large number of particular cases there. So this is a picture of a model at a certain point projecting forward. Um, here we have up to time 35 incorporating data and it's anticipating um, numbers going, going forward from there. Xiao Yan will show you many other graphs like this. Here, here we're up to times 58, and it's projecting forward what it thinks will be the case. You'll notice here, 
There's been a long period of low number of cases. And so inexorably, that's led to a number of particles that have, excuse me, a number of susceptibles that have been rising. And with a rising number of susceptibles comes a rising level of risk. And so the tinder is set. The, the kindling has been built up. And all it takes is that stochastic spark to begin the flame. And that's what's, that's what's occurring here. It anticipates an outbreak because of the high risk associated with the number of susceptibles. And its prediction is borne out. Chao Yan can show you many uh, ex other examples um, like this. OK. Um, that's the intuition between particle filters. Um, particle filters are underwritten by this notion of a particle. Each particle posits a different hypothesis about what's going on now. And each particle is associated with a weight, a weight that indicates its relative plausibility in light of evidence to this point. Okay? Um, it's performed recursively. And what that means is, as each new data point comes in, it doesn't have to go back and consider all previous data points all at once in some sort of batched way. Rather, it just takes the weights as they were before this data point comes in and it updates them with, actually by multiplying by the likelihood that we will have observed these, these, this new observation given the, the um, things believed by the part of this particular particle in terms of the number of people susceptible, infected, recovered, et cetera. This is based on um, a technique known as uh, importance sampling, which I may talk more about uh, in, in a later lecture. Um, but basically, we are using the principles of something called sequential importance sampling to shape, to sample from the distribution of, of possible states of the system. Um, and the weight is used, it plays a critical role in the important sampling uh, process. So when we talk about particles, and indeed when we run a model that we've shared with you, and you look at the, at the different stocks, the different accumulations, like the number of susceptibles, the number of infectives, you will see that for each particle, there's a value of that stock. This particle believes that a certain number of susceptible, a certain number of infected, a certain number of exposed, a certain number of recovered, and it's, it's taking that stance. That's its working hypothesis. This other particle believes it's a different number, and a different number of each of those, a different value for each of those. And that weight reflects how well that particle is accorded with, with past, um, past uh, incoming estimates as its value has been evolved. So each particle is associated with a copy of the model state, a complete uh, rendition for every state in the model, every stock in the model, what the value is, and there's a survival of the fittest. And particles that are not consistent die out. There's a process known as resampling that actually kills them off. Particles that are consistent with the evidence are multiplied. They're fruitful, and they multiply within the model. Um, trajectories consistent with the data survive. And so the model gets honed. It gets, it gets increasingly sharpened in its estimate of the underlying state in, in a state of evolving uh, parameters. Typically, there's a fixed number of particles. And those particles that die out get replaced by particles that get multiplied. So here, we might have each particle would have a certain value for number of susceptibles, exposed, infectives, recovered, and vaccinated. And it's almost like this model is being run with many different values of uh, many different particles in parallel. But there's a process when new observations come in that will weed out some of those estimates and multiply others of them. Okay? Um, so these, uh, a particle will have particular values for each of these. Um, and uh, in between observations, the particles just go forward according to the model. Particle weights stay the same. There's no filtering out. But in an observation point, ah, that's the rub. 
particle weights are updated to reflect the likelihood for that particle that you would have seen this incoming update. Maybe there's a particle that posits obstreperously very few susceptibles. It thinks uh, they're all susceptibles are a thing of the past. Those have all been drained away. You know, um, those past outbreaks have just about drained them away. There's very few of them, um, and and then an estimate comes in or an observation comes in that shows a very significant number of new infections. That particle will be embarrassed, <laughs> ashamed. Its weight will be dinged by multiplying at very a likelihood, which is very small, given that it says, nah, there's no more than 10 susceptibles. No way. And you know, there's 15 new infections. It, it will hang its head. And its weight will be multiplied by a likelihood of observing 15 new infections given 10, given 10 posited, uh, 10 posited number of susceptibles, which essentially will set its weight to a, a minuscule value, if not zero, and it will be weeded out. It will be weeded out. And, and a particle that, that uh, has a more competitive hypothesis, working hypothesis, um, one that says, you know, there's actually probably quite a few susceptibles there, and there's quite a few infectives, and probably quite a few exposed. That will have been more consistent with the evidence, and it will replace that particle that is sent to the back bench, to sent, 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 uh, sent away with its head hanging. So with it, with, because it's been weeded out, it'll be replaced by one that's consistent. And this is a stochastic model. So it looks deterministic. Uh, normally, a model like this would be deterministic. But for particle filtering to work, the underlying model does need to be sto have some stochastics. And this is, in fact, varying stochastically the context per week or the log context per week, technically. And there's some stochastics in many models associated with new infections. You'll see that in the Xiaoyan model. Um, so here, the particles may be duplicated, you know, a, a very a particle that's behaved in a very way, very consistent with the data, and the meritocracy of particle filtering, it will be multiplied, it will be cloned, as it were, and another particle will take its place. But as soon as it takes its place, because the system evolves stochastically, they will diverge in their expectations going forward. So between observations, the model just runs forward. It's like each particle is in its own world, just moving forward with its inexorable um, expectations as the model evolves. A new observation comes in, that's the reckoning. That is the reckoning. The weights get updated, and particles will often get resampled, so the, the, the ones that are not consistent die out, and the ones that are consistent get multiplied. We will run a model like this typically with thousands of particles. Simultaneously, Shadow Yanis has run her model uh, with, uh, with what, 5,000 particles uh, very commonly. Um, and they jostle with different explanations, different hypotheses for what's going on. And that leads to this sort of, uh, to these sort of pictures that you see in terms of these underlying distributions. But again, it's important to know, and I hope, hope you'll chew on this is, if this is not an obvious thing. What's shown here um, in, this, uh, in these pictures is actually uh, a little bit of, a, uh, of, of, of something that could be misread. These, these pictures show a distribution at a given time, let's say time 60, um, which I believe is here. Um, so time, time 60, um, we have a certain number of people susceptible. There's a distribution here. That's why that's wide. It's not one point estimate, it's a distribution. So if we were to cut it and look at it from the side, we'd see a, a little peak here, and it would come down. But that distribution is not just a marginal distribution, meaning it's not just for that value here in, in isolation. We actually, what the particles give us, if we look at the different particles, each particle posits something very specific about this, 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 and this, and this. And so, while it's true that 
that there is some range of possibilities for what the particles posit from the number of susceptibles. Um, each of those particles that posits a specific thing for the susceptibles also posits a specific thing for the infectives. Okay? And that's not really shown here, this, this co-variation. Um, it could be shown in scatter plots uh, for each point in time, but it's not. So this is a little bit about particle filtering at an intuitive level. We're running our model with many hypotheses. The hypotheses are associated with things called particles. And those particles uh, compete to explain the data. The particles that are more consistent with the data are multiplied. The particles that are less consistent with the data die out. And having, having then at any one point consumed all the data, if you have a joint distribution over all the underlying states of the system, the underlying stocks, which allows you to then project forward probabilistically, allows you to ask what if questions about interventions, or to examine the possibilities of what's going on right now. For example, how many people are there with latent TB right now uh, out there in the world, which might be something that's hard to sample without a great deal of expense. It's so a little bit about the intuition of particle filtering. I think it'll become more obvious if you see some case studies. So uh, Christine, what are we doing in terms of time for further sustenance? Mm -hmm. Well, further sustenance is anticipated to occur at 2.30. At, at 2.30? Yeah. Um, OK. Um, so uh, first of all, let me, let me see if I can answer any questions about this. and. Then, uh, as time allows, I think we'll, we'll ask for a case study, if that's OK. okay? Yes? So, so what's going on in the, in the, in the time periods, the gaps there, the susceptible, where there's, there's no, there's no data um, at those time points? You mean like here? Or, or in, in between, in, oh. in between you know, the sort of, there's, there's blank space. Oh, oh, you mean these little things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, so, so, um, I, don't, I don't know how to say this politely, but um, that is, it turns out that that's an artifact of the plotting, okay? So, so when- They're, they're really out, they're really out of those times. Yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, um, and it's, sometimes and as a computer scientist makes me, it makes me ashamed, <laughs> to be honest, but, there, there, are, there are times, it may not have escaped your notice, where you know, we try when we build computational systems to be able to allow people, like Ethica is an example, right? To operate at a high level um, of, of function and not worry about all the details about where data is stored in Cassandra or exactly where does it live or you know, um, uh, the fact that it's needed to go fetch it over a network and so on. But you may have noted that with computational systems, sometimes even someone who wants to operate at a high level only is rudely surprised by, by things that are going on at a low level. You'll, you'll get like a message in your browser that says like, cannot resolve host, right? I mean, you saw that this morning, right? I went to a, a website that should have been online. The, the creator of it thinks it's online. Um, and it ain't online. And, and that's a, a rude thing. I mean, it's, it's not like the website isn't there. It's, it's there. It's waiting for it to be called. But it's just an awkward fact about its registration that it's lapsed. It's some dumb little bit that you know should be different. And and there are times where you go to Ethica, right? And and maybe your connection is flaky, your internet connection, and won't be able to connect. And it'll say you know uh, could not connect. And it's like oh man. It's like, why do, why do you have to worry about these little silly little things which are below my level of interest? Um, <laughs> they get in the way. Unfortunately, our human bodies are like that too, as I sometimes remind our students, right? Like, normally, we think we shouldn't have to worry about the vagaries of what's going on chemically in our DNA, except there can be a mutation that causes a cancer, and then we have to worry big time about it, and it, you know, it, it causes all sorts of disturbance in our life, right? Um, so. So it's not just uh, computational systems, but this is an example of that sort of little silly yeah. 
silly, it's a dumb little thing that's of no conceptual significance. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just, it, it, I think probably it's slightly off in the width of this compared to the number of particles, so it, it puts a space so that, you know, if there's 100 things here and it's showing 95, it has to insert five spaces somewhere. And it asserts them in, 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 in certain. <laughs> no. It's especially frustrating when you know what's going on at that level, and it's like you shouldn't have to worry about it. Don't don't worry about it. It's it's not a it's it, it has no bearing on the discussion. Good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, We're but I still a, apologize. We'll for put a sticky note up there next time and cover it. Yeah. Please ignore the. The, the white spaces between the particles. Um, okay, other questions? So. That's good. I, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm, I'm glad I wasn't using some key thing. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it's still a shame, that, but, yeah. um, but I won't set my weight to zero. Um, yeah, yeah. I have two questions. I think it's maybe uh, I'm just trying to get my head around it. <coughs> How do you define particles? Because we talked about them at your and you can use the word hypothesis, so I'm thinking like yep. I usually conceptualize hypotheses. I get the sense that you're not actually defining hypotheses, the algorithm or the program is doing that. But I just want to clarify that a little bit for myself. And then as you're talking about, you know, one new piece of data comes in and then all the particles are reevaluated and those that didn't do a very good job get weeded out. Do you ever get in a situation where you're weeding them out too quickly, that like there's an anomaly and now you've weeded out all of these yeah. particles that actually down the line would have predicted yeah. better, and is there any opportunity to weed yeah. back in, yeah. and what would impact that in terms of the amount of data or right. variables? Yeah. Great question. Um, so, um, so a particle, so uh, forgive me, because you asked what is a particle. Um, you want to know what a particle? I'll, I'll tell you what a particle. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, 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 so a particle is a sample from a proposal distribution, um, and this is in a, in a technical sense. So, so, so there are times we want to. Gosh, um, there are times we want to sample from a distribution. Um, and we don't have a mechanism, like if we want a sample from a, a uniform distribution, the distribution which gives us equal chance of having any value from one to 10, we know how to do that really easily. Um, we know how to write an algorithm to do that. But when you want a sample from a distribution that, that, that has um, a shape that you can't describe in terms of a, of a simple, like it's not a normal distribution, an exponential distribution, it's, it's rather a, a very complex and often emergent distribution. Um, we can't actually just sample from it. We, we, uh, we can't just say, hey, give me that value. What we do is we engage with something called important sampling. And, and basically what it is is um, we, uh, we sample from a, a distribution we can't sample from easily. And then we, we relate what the probability is on, on that proposal distribution, it's called, to what we really want to get, which is a sample from the final distribution we really want. And um, I, I will create a slide for this to show it. But the idea is is somewhat like this. And I have to I pot, I have to apologize because I, you know, I'm I'm showing something that can only be viewed by half the room at a time. Maybe. Yeah. Um, okay. So if if I want to sample from some um, from some distribution that has some sort of funny shape to it, you know, something like that. And um, I, uh, I, I have trouble, maybe, maybe I can't express this shape using a, a nice formula and so on. And, and this is, in this case, it's multidimensional, which makes it particularly problematic. I can't just use its cumulative distribution. Um, what I can do is I can sample from another distribution that I know will cover this area. And the samples from this guy, um, you know, I'll get a lot of samples out here and out here, which are very unlikely with that guy, right? So what I do is I actually sample from this. 
my students are, are I think, loving these sort of things, because they may get asked to do this on a PhD exam. And um, they probably like to see how I answer it. Um, so, um, so <laughs> maybe it's vicarious enjoyment. Um, OK, so, so you know, if we sample from this distribution, this square, this uniform distribution, it's really easy to sample from. We can, we can sample from that very, very nicely. Oh, I wish, I wish the folks online could see this. Um, but, um, but, uh, but those samples from this guy are very unlikely for the distribution we really want to sample from down here. So what we do, it's, it's just a great hack, OK? It's, it's, it's a great trick. And it works beautifully, and it's awesome. Trust me, OK? Um, you, you actually call this, um, this distribution you want to sample from p of x, OK? So at a certain point, it will have a certain value p of x, OK? Um, that's its, sort of its probability, uh, probably density, it's called, but of, of this. And this distribution at that same point will have a value q of x, OK? Um, uh, in this case, q of x is way above p of x, OK? So what we do is we basically take the ratio, and, and actually because these are distributions that need to sum to one, it'll be more like q of x is like this. It'll be down, down, down here. It, it won't be all above it, which is impossible. So uh, mumble. OK, where's the eraser? Um, thank you. Um, so sorry to make a mess of this. I just wanted to avoid confusing people with that. So here's q of x, this, this uniform distribution here. And, and to make it even more plausible, I'll draw, it, I'll draw it like this. This is a uniform distribution where at every point, so this is p of x is the one we want to sample from. Here we go, p of x. And this is q of x here. Man, I wish Cam were here uh, to see this. Um, OK, here's q of x, OK? Now, as I said, if we sample out here with q of x, we know we're going to get a lot more of them from, Q, from, 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 the, from the proposal distribution from Q of x than we would from this guy, right? Because it's very unlikely here. Similarly, in this region, we're going to get more of them from Q of x than we would from this, uh, this distribution P of x. Because in Q of x, this is equally likely to all the other places, but not here. And same thing here. We're going to get a lot of those, right? So how do we deal with it? Ah, we sample from this uniform distribution. Get those samples. Mm -mm, really easy to sample, eh? It's, this is like totally, this, this is, is completely straightforward to sample from in terms of computational. We sample from each of those, and then we label it with something that is the ratio of this guy to this guy. So at each point, we, we sample from some point, x. We, we get something at x. This is x right there. It doesn't always make that sound, but it's, it's great when it does. So we, 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 we know what x is. We get a value out. And we say, how likely is that value to occur with the target distribution, p of x, compared to q of x? Um, and, and that gives us this, this ratio, right? Um, and we weight the sample by this. Okay, This is called the weight. This, ladies and gentlemen, is called the weight of that sample. So we sample an x, and we give it a weight. And basically, if that weight is 2, it kind of counts like two, two normal samples. If its weight is 0.5, it means uh, you need two of them to count to as good as a, as, a, as a normal sample. If its weight is 1, then, oh, we treat it as a, as a full sample. Okay. So what it's going to do, and then, ah, oh, now this is the thing. You sample like. A, a thousand times from this, okay? And you get all these different values, different x's, right? Here's x1, here's x2, here's x3. Um, I hope my students are listening to this. You got to know this. You got to know it in your bones to really understand particle filtering. Okay? Um, it's also good to know it in your brain, but, uh, but in your bones will help. Um, okay? Um, so we get a whole swack of these different things. We get a thousand of them, a thousand. And each of them is associated with a weight. Each of them is associated with the weight. And basically, the weight tells us how much to seriously consider this as a sample. Like, like if, if we have something that's way out here, right? Um, P of x, this guy here, divided by Q of x will be really small. Because P of x is way down here, Q of x is way up here. 
And so P of X and Q of X would be really small. And so it's basically saying, hey, don't worry about that as much. The ones that are here, like at these peaks, man, those, if we pick one of those, you know, maybe we get that in X6 or something, that one we treat as, oh, that's, that's a really high weight sample because it's very likely to occur in P of, uh, P of X or the Q of X. So having gotten all those thousand samples, we're not done yet. Those are our particles, okay? <laughs> those are our particles. We're not done yet. We then sample from them according to their weight. So we draw from them according with a probability of getting each one according to its weight. Okay, so the ones that have two are more, much more likely to be, have, to be drawn, twice as likely to be drawn as one with a weight of one. And compared with the weight of one-tenth, man, a weight of two is 20 times as likely to be drawn as a weight of one-tenth. So we draw from those, and guess what? The, after the entire process, guess what we sampled from? We have sampled from P of X. We have sampled from this guy through that two-step process. By drawing from Q of X, and then giving weights, and then sampling from those, it's as if we've sampled from P of X. And here, guess what sampling from P of X is? It's the distribution. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> it's the distribution associated with the state uh, in light of the probability of having a certain underlying state of the model given all the data you've seen till now. And it is awesome. <laughs> It is awesome. So, okay, so there's no rioting going on yet. Um, but, you know, maybe it'll sink in eventually. Um, so, fundamentally, this is a way of sampling. These weights are just, are, are just exactly what these are. And they're a step towards allowing you to sample from the distribution over the possible states of the model in light of the evidence that you have seen thus far in the model structure. So it provides a way of, of sampling from the underlying distribution of, of states in light of, of all the evidence you've seen. In other words, which states are more likely given all the evidence you've seen in the model structure and which states are less likely given the model structure. That's what the and the particles are these samples. Particles are these guys. And particles evolve over time. Why? Because the model state evolves over time. It evolves over time according to the logic of the model. We run these models and the number of susceptibles goes down as the number of infectives goes up and, and you know, empires rise and fall and so on and, and things play out over time in the model. Um, Christina's probably having a ball watching something. <laughs> <laughs> she, I mean, she's trying to write a paper back there. <laughs> it's horrible. Um, Don't worry, I'm recording everything you do for the next, you know, check up with your psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about my wife? Oh. <laughs> so, um, so, so particles are samples. They're samples from a target, uh, uh, the samples from a, a proposal distribution. And what we're trying to do is to estimate the distribution of, of model states given all the data we've seen and, and given model structure. And the particles are a convenient way to, to represent different hypotheses for what the current situation is. But hypotheses which have high weights associated with them are, are really more important hypotheses. They're, they're well represented. You know, if, you have a hypo if we have a particle with a weight of 10, really it counts 10 times as much in our estimate as a, as a weight of one. And basically the particles posit at a certain time, this is the situation in the underlying model. Yeah? Yeah. Um, okay, so, so, so a long answer to a short question. But I hope for my students that even if it doesn't bring tears to your eyes, it will at least it will inspire inspire and appreciation. Yeah. It's awesome. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> next question. <laughs> next question. Yeah. yeah. Is the follow up to that? Like yeah. How do you, is there ever a situation in the where is it likely that you will maybe toss out particles too soon? Toss out. 
Oh, yeah. This new point of data came in, yeah. and it was so far off from this one, so we're checking this one yeah. out. And then, but that yeah. point of data. It can, it can happen. You get a really anomalous particle, and it may lead to jettisoning particles that actually would have been responsive. Now, the way in which, so, so um, one thing that we do uh, frequently is we don't always, so, so this dying off, this competition is, is competition of the fittest, you know, on the particles that are really uh, fit, uh, multiply the others die off. That die off, it turns out, doesn't always occur every observation. Um, and it's really needed so we don't constantly just entertain a huge number of low pl plausible um, uh, particles, low plausibility hypotheses. Um, we really want to put our, you know, invest more in high plausible hypotheses so we consider variants of them, not, not things that are vanishingly unlikely. And so there's this balance about keeping around low weight particles um, because they consume resources. They prevent us from considering variants of, 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 of really competitive hypotheses. At the same time, if we throw them away too early, they, we may kind of lock ourselves, we may blind ourselves to a set of possibilities that those would have represented. And one, uh, Xiao Yan just spoke about this. So Xiao Yan defended uh, successfully on, um, on Friday. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and this is uh, related to a question that was asked, like, um, uh, about, about uh, particles and, you know, to what degree could particles say recover after a certain period of time? And I would, uh, from of no data, for example, where they grow increasingly uncertain and then new data comes in, could they rally and, and represent it? Or, or if, a weird, if a weird anomaly came in and then, and then you started getting more, you know, less anomalous data, would they recover? With a large enough set of particles, they're going to be able to recover, typically. So, you know, uh, Shaoyan might run it with 5,000 particles or 10,000 particles, and we might only resample them maybe you know one every one every ten times ten observations or something so if you have a couple of anonymous observations you, you won't you won't just throw them away and it actually takes I mean each particle is going to be imperfect in its predictions and and even if it's close to bang on in terms of predictions it's not going to have a weight close to unity typically and so you're going to have a variety of particle weights it's it's not the case that typically most get thrown out. It's it's there's a uh, there's a um, a weeding out of the really unlikely ones to be sure, but a lot typically survive. And so you've got this rich competing agora, this marketplace of different ideas about what's going on, and they're competing. And generally, in my experience, it's pretty robust. I mean, Shaoyan can show you from her model or or Anahita from hers. But it's it's pretty robust concerning the insults of kind of weird data points. They it tends to bounce back because you start getting some other data points, and that rewards these particles that were kind of uh, you know kind of uh, given short shrift for a while, and they start bouncing back. And the particles that were that that flourished basically in almost readings start losing their currency and go back to, uh, to isolation. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then how do you just, like, is it you, the modeler that determines the weight as to when you discard? Or is it that you mentioned the observation, that maybe you give it four observations before you dis decide to cut off some of the particles? Like how does that so yeah, it's a good question. So what, we'll get you in front of one of these models shortly, OK? So you can yeah. run it. It's a lot of fun to run. Okay, for those of us with geeky tendencies, <laughs> Christina's going to book my next appointment. Um, uh, Why are these fun? So, um, uh, I used to have a, I used to have a button that I got at MIT called Nerd Pride, and I would wear it with pride. Um, <laughs> then I gave it to another nerd, um, and I lost it. Um, uh, but in any case, um, uh, so. The modeler can set 
certain thresholds that will govern how, how aggressively it weeds out particles. So there's a, a, it's basically a criteria called, and for some of you this may be a meaningful term, effective sample size. Um, and, um, and, and basically it has to do with um, the, uh, the, the, the degree to which the, the population of particles is really capturing um, a, a variety of, of high, high plausible different hypotheses. And to what degree it's overwhelmingly you know, represent all these very implausible scenarios. And you can set that threshold higher or lower as to how aggressively you want to cut it out. And it will, um, it will take action accordingly. Um, it's interesting. Um, early in my time with particle filtering, I, I, I engaged in <coughs> frobbing behavior with that weight quite a bit. So I would, I would, uh, I would um, change it. I would frob it. Um, adjust it a little bit and and I actually haven't found a big need to adjust it a lot. Um, there's some other aspects of the model that we do tune more. Um, um, trying to get the initial distribution right is is one of them that I know Cheyenne has spent a lot of time with. Um, Cheyenne or, or Anahita, have you spent a lot of time with that effective sample size parameter? No. No. It, I think I think a lot of it is if you're only dealing with something like 200 particles, you got to be pretty careful about what that mix is. But if you're dealing with, you know, 10,000, let a thousand flowers bloom. I mean, you can, you can have you can have a wide variety of hypotheses there without impoverishing the representation of what's captured. You can you can bear to keep around some lower likelihood particles, lower likelihood hypotheses. To weather the um, those anomalous readings without without undue problems, and it's one of the bequests of of, um, of computational power these days that we can we can you know simulate a model with five thousand particles without undue stress. Um, uh, Xiao Yan, how long does that model model with five thousand particles take to run? Uh, for the aggregate model, for the aggregate model, so. maybe an hour an hour to run for 40 years worth of data or something like that. Yeah, yeah. 432 observations. 432 observations, monthly observations, mm -hmm. and, and yearly observations. Yeah. And then so you could choose 5,432 <coughs> observations. So that was my next question in terms of how much data do you need to be able to set particle? Yeah, so, so the question was, sir? So there's, so there's that, so yeah, how long has the time series and how much data do you need to have, is there, is there a relationship between setting 200 versus 5,000 particles? Oh, yeah. The amount of data that you have or need or? Great, great question. The, the number of hypotheses you keep around um, is a pretty important consideration. Um, if, so actually, Anahita and Shayan have both done quite a lot with, when you have few particles as well, I mean, for, for for like experimenting, you might have, uh, I think I've seen Shaw, yeah, run with like 100 particles um, for short periods of time, just like to see, if, to see if she's gotten a certain change to the model correct or whatever. But that isn't production quality, you know, that's not, that's not sufficient to then draw conclusions from it. For that, you wanna you run, a, run it with a industrial strength particle collection, like 5,000 or 10,000. But what, what does require more particles, in my experience, and I think Xiao Yan has seen evidence of this very strongly, because she's been working with a growing number of models that are larger in the sense that they have many age groups and each age group is taken care of and they have aging processes and mixing between different age groups. It's quite complex. Um, so, sorry, it is technically complex. All these models are, are at, at a technical complex. They're nonlinear, the holes are in some of the parts. But it is also quite complicated in the sense that there's a large number of moving parts, uh, et cetera. And Xiao Yan has, um, has found that the number of particles, as, as, I might, as I posited, the number <coughs> of particles has to be larger if the so-called, if the number of states, of the possible states of the model is larger. And so if you have more stocks, you have more of these accumulations, you need to take 
take into account. Each particle needs to take a stance with respect to the value of each of the states. You want a larger number of particles because you want to explore the set of possible state states and you want to explore the possible states and state space more, more fully. And so if you have lots of states, you need more particles to, 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 to capture the richness of that state space. And so, you know, we, we've done quite a bit of work also with a larger, um, uh, larger model for what's called PLCMC, which is another technique that I'll be talking about yet, which combines the best of particle collecting with the best of MCMC. And there, we need, um, uh, we actually need uh, a large number, of, a very large number of particles. Uh, what were you running with this summer? Do you remember? Uh, I remember only one thousand particles, but with several thousand, maybe 10,000, 10, iterations. Yeah, we ran it with iterations, but we did we did a bunch of runs also. I thought with large number of particles. All. Oh, is that right? Okay. So it wasn't wasn't as many as I remembered then. Um, yeah. Um, so so in any case, that's something that shapes the number of, of particles. You can certainly get a richer picture out with more particles. If you start getting like a hundred particles, it, it looks kind of sclerotic. I mean, it's it's kind of uh, in, impoverished in terms of the distributions. You get sort of ragged distributions. You start to see sort of trajectories of particular particles rather than a a nice distribution. When you start to get up to thousands of particles, then you start to see these nice distributions. Of, I think it's fair to say. Or maybe maybe it's many hundred, but um, it doesn't, it, it, it certainly doesn't look like a nice well behaved distribution with just a small number of particles from my experience. Other, other questions? It's great time. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll reconvene in uh, fifteen minutes. Um, I, I'd like a, a show of hands. I'm, I'm going to choose a couple things to do this afternoon. Um, uh, how many people after the break would like to see a case study for particle filter? Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, I think we'll go with that. Uh, and I wanna get you engaged in hands-on behavior. And so I think what we'll do um, uh, is, Xiaoyan, uh, would you be ready to give a case study? Anahita is also ready, but one of the things I'm thinking about is you've already shared your model, right, on the site. So people could go download that and they could run it. Um, and so if they wanted to play around with your model while you were talking, they, they could even do that. And then maybe we'll have Anahita go a little bit later, uh, where Anahita is gonna be talking about something really interesting, combining the modeling with uh, data from communicational behavior, big data from online uh, search, search data, and how that adds to the model. So we'll have, Chayens go first uh, so people can play around with the model. People who want to watch the case study carefully can do so. People who want to engage in probing with the model can, can probe it. Um, and, then, and then we'll, uh, we'll have an Anahita case study shortly thereafter. Is that okay? Okay, that's great. So in case people are wondering, because I've gotten asked before, probing is somewhere between, it's an MIT term meaning somewhere between, on the one hand, fiddling, which is kind of aimless, and tweaking, which is very, very specific. You sort of frog to, you're, you're trying to achieve something, but you're trying it, it's not quite tweaking because you're trying it over broader ranges. You're saying, oh, that's, that's interesting, let me try this. So it's quite directed, whereas tweaking is kind of often, it's just fiddling around with it. And, and oh, sorry, tweaking is very specific, and fiddling is, is just playing around with it. Anyway. So, so probing is, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, a exploratory activity that's, um, uh, that's uh, good for, for developing learning.